comrades, welcome back to the Discerning Gamer. We're here with the fifth and final part of our Steel Division tutorial series, which is focusing on division deck creation. If this is the first part of the tutorial that you've caught, it might not be a bad place to start actually, but I have covered the fundamental gameplay mechanics in the preceding four episodes, and the first episode shows you just basically how to start a game off without hopefully getting pantsed in the opening moment so that way you can kind of jump in and have a play before necessarily going and uh, digging deep into exactly the division that you want to play and how you want to put that deck together and remember guys this machine runs on props so if you've been enjoying the series found it useful uh, please a like would be much appreciated and of course subscribe if you'd like to see more of this kind of tutorial and gameplay series so back to the matter at hand guys Let's look at how we create decks for the divisions that we want to play. So currently I'm looking at the 3rd Canadian Infantry. However, this isn't a specific guide on how to make a deck for the 3rd Canadian Infantry. It's more like a kind of general outline of things that we should bear in mind whilst we're building our division decks and also just a bit of the mechanics and considerations that go into making these decks. So when I'm coming to a division completely fresh, what I like to do is basically just work my way through the various unit tabs from left to right. So starting with recon, moving through to infantry, tanks, etc. And I just take what looks good to me and then eventually you'll begin to see through a number of factors where this division has its strengths. And there's a couple of different things that we can tell are divisional strengths. It might be, for example, how their uh, resources are allocated through the phases veteran units, particularly um, high tier units, you know, Panthers and high end tanks or something like that. So once we've found the strength, I like to then deck the division out with all the strongest stuff in that area that it can, and then look to shore up the weaknesses and pick other units that emphasize its strengths. So let's look at some of the things that we have to take into account when putting together our divisions. Firstly, in the top left, we see the phases of combat, A, B, and C and the amount of resources we'll be receiving per minute in those phases of combat. So as you can see, they're labeled combat recon, skirmish, and battle. And this represents the coming together of the divisions. If you imagine a meeting engagement, the forward reconnaissance elements are gonna meet first, then the sort of front part of the main body, and then the main body of the division will collide. And as a result, we get for different units, depending on how the division is formulated, they get different amounts of resources and cards to activate in that period. And this is probably one of the biggest indicators of how your game plan should play out as any particular division. So with the 3rd Canadian Infantry, we can see that they have 70 points per minute in phase A, and that's really low. Um, meaning that when they get into phase B and C, they're going to receive huge surfeit of resources. And this is where they are expecting to really take the fight to the enemy and show their chops. So what that might suggest to me looking at this deck for the first time is that actually in the beginning of the game, we're going to be looking to make do with cheap units, not as many units, and probably fighting more of a holding action, just trying to hold on to as much ground as we can before we start bringing a lot more weight of units and our heavy hitters out later on in phase B and C. So having an idea of what resources each division might be able to bring to bear in each phase of the battle is a pretty uh, strong thing to understand before going in. But broadly speaking, you can guess based on what kind of division they are. So infantry divisions are strong, kind of ponderous, um, forces that will look to bring a lot of stuff to battle whereas an armoured division or a reconnaissance division or an airborne division for example will look to be a lot more aggressive in the early game and more like a spearhead where perhaps they'll look to take a lot of ground off you in the early game and then in the late game will look to weather the storm that something like an infantry division or a armoured division might be able to bring to bear on it during the later phases of the, of the game. Another important resource to understand when creating decks is activation points. So these, the number of points available can actually vary in between different divisions. So for example, the 3rd Canadian Infantry has 40 total, but some that are specialist divisions 
might emphasize more high quality units by having less of them, giving them overall less activation points. You'll also notice that on a division by division basis, the number of cards that they can bring in each individual category will change. So for example, here we can see that the um, third Canadian can bring a huge amount of recon cards, you know, with seven slots there. And we'll also notice that they've got a lot of infantry slots. However, being a um, infantry division, they have fewer armor slots and that sort of stuff. And we'll notice that each card that we drop up into the slots at the top, which represent our choices, actually um, cost us one activation slot each. Now, another rule of thumb vis-a-vis -vis activation points is the later on in the battle, the more each card is worth to you. And that might be in the quality of troops in the card, the number of troops that that card will allow you to bring, or even uh, heavier or better units. So with some divisions, say for example with the third Canadian here who have definitely a de-emphasized um, combat recon phase, it's almost as if for an efficient deck build I want to take just enough stuff to get me through the combat recon phase because as soon as I get into phase B and C, if I spend the majority of my activation points and fill my deck out with the majority of my cards from phase B and C, that will be worth a lot more to me. It will mean that I'll get veteran troopers, more troopers per card in better transports and access to my better units like my Wolverines and Shermans and things like that. And this can be flipped on its head a little bit by uh, things like airborne divisions where the majority of their stuff will come in uh, you'll want to bring in the combat recon phase where you make your most bread, as it were. But as a general rule of thumb, that's something to consider when spending your activation points. Now, before we go on and look at each of the different tabs, let's just have a look at how these cards themselves actually work. So we can see in the top left, we've got a indicator of a certain unit special classification. So for our recon, that's a binocular showing that they are in inherently meant to be a reconnaissance unit. You might also see something that shows them as artillery, as a command unit, um, things like that. So look out for that. Further along the top of the card, we see stars. That represents their veterancy. So the, as I've discussed in my other tutorials, veterancy has a number of beneficial um, characteristics for each particular unit type. So below that, we see the letter of the phase that this uh, card will be able to be called in at. We see the art for the unit itself. Then we see the number of each of the actual unit that this card will allow us to call in. So say for example, we wanted to get some four sniper scouts in phase A, we'd have to take two of the cards uh, because they're worth two each. And of course that would cost us more activation points. Now below that, we also see the name of the unit and a plus with a little silhouette of a vehicle. So for any infantry and w crude weapons, they will come in with a vehicle that acts as transport for them. And this can take a couple of different shapes. The most basic will just be some sort of um, unarmored, unarmed transport truck. And those are usually pretty quick, do well on the road, poor off-road, and they are literally there just to get your units there initially in the battle. And once you give them the um, unload command, the transport they're in will withdraw and actually cease to be controlled by the player. Now, uh, I believe the Willy's Jeep is one such vehicle for um, small two-man or two uh, smaller unit types or weapon crews. Um, but we can also get things like, for example, the Humber or a 251 um, half track for the Germans. And that will actually stay as an independent unit in its own right throughout the course of the battle. So often looking at the card of the crew or the infantry unit itself is important. But also look where, you know, oftentimes half of the cost of that unit is going is the transport it comes in. And they can give you, you know, very special uh, additional capabilities to that unit. So for example, a um, two-man or four-man recce squad that comes in on its own has very little firepower. However, if, you, if it comes with a Humber, that can sit behind the recce, wait till the threat is identified, and then pull itself forward to suddenly give that unit a lot more firepower 
and I suppose also protection when it's initially being deployed. So now we'll move on to having a look at the infantry tab for the 3rd Canadian. And as we can see, this has a huge number of potential activation slots and all of our infantry is veteran. And we also have access to really powerful rifle leader units that not only have a um, command radius, they are themselves two-star veteran, and they have access to a P app for that heat anti-tank um, effect that we covered in our previous uh, videos on this series. So we can see quite clearly that this is where we want to be emphasizing our strength as the third Canadian. And we combine this with the other knowledge that we've got that perhaps we want to try and bias ourselves to bringing more cards in phase B and C where we're going to have more resources to actually flood the field with units. As to which of these units we might like to take, this is all covered in my uh, infantry tutorial video that came before this and likewise with armour as we move on to that next. So looking at the 3rd Canadian's armour, we can see that they only have a potential 4 activation slots for it and that in phase A, they can literally only, if they spend any of their activation points on that, it's only going to bring them in one card, uh, one tank per card. So really that's telling you that perhaps it's a good idea to take that one tank, but you, that's like an MVP unit and you're not going to get anything else for phase A. Um, during that time so take very special care of that and then we can see phase B starts to look a bit more promising you know for we can bring in four tanks for one of those cards um, then but really where we're going to be making our money and probably wanting to bias our card selections is phase C where just one card can bring us in six Sherman 3s or two Fireflies which are real MVP tanks in the game. Now one thing we'll also notice is that broadly speaking, the more veteran a card worth of units is, the lower the availability that that card gives you. So that actually, for example, look at phase B here, the unveteran Shermans, you get literally double the amount compared to the veteran one. So it does show you the benefit of veterancy, but that's also a um, consideration that you have to be taking. So support is a funny tab and it will change wildly what it gives you depending on which division that you're working with but this is often where you get kind of odd odd one out units or units that are specifically meant to support I suppose where the strength of your division is so first up here and I'd say probably the thing most worth taking in support for the uh, third Canadian we get the dingo and this looks like a, a really unremarkable lightly armored car with you know just a Bren gun in it, so nothing to write home about. But the power of this is that it's a command vehicle, and it's also light and fast, and does have some armor. So um, for relatively inexpensive cost, you've got a mobile machine platform, machine gun platform that actually gives your um, infantry a boost. And um, you can also see later on we get things like, for example, the um, priest DD, which works very well in support of infantry in that it's pretty heavily armoured but has a direct fire massive HE shell that can be used to support infantry pushes at, you know, rooting out particularly stubborn enemy positions. S uh, support is also where we see our supply trucks and those of course give us additional fuel, repairs and um, ammunition for all of our units so these are pretty important as well but obviously less important if you're mostly using infantry. Anti-tank is where we can see basically anything that's specialised towards taking out tanks, as you'd expect. Uh, and this can mean armoured vehicles themselves, other tanks, infantry crews like a Piat. But I think the real MVP from this tab is always going to be your anti-tank guns, the um, sort of infantry crewed guns. And the reason why is because they have Great range, they're usually inexpensive, but they can be very easily stealthed, as I covered in my recon video. And that can enable you to make big value trades where, you know, your opponent is spending, say, 150 on a decent tank, but you can spend almost half that on an anti-tank gun. And with the right positioning and support, that can actually knock out that tank and put a stop to an enemy push, but also 
give you a resource advantage where you've had to spend less to take out more of the enemy's investment. And you'll also notice that with the 3rd Canadian, a lot of their infantry does not have any sort of um, heat anti-tank weapon. That's their, their general units don't have piats, only their leaders do, or the specific piat teams that we can bring here. So this is one of those areas where we would look to really carefully kit out our anti-tank um, portion of the deck in order to make up for the weakness or a potential vulnerability of our infantry. That being said, it's also a potentially very strong synergy because when we've got lots of high quality infantry, that means we can spread out our forces over a long line and the anti-tank guns then have great flanking protection, they have great uh, net to detect where enemy tanks are coming through, and of course, if you're using tanks and you want to knock out an anti-tank gun, what do you want really is recon to spot it, artillery to suppress it, infantry to knock it out before your tanks can then exploit the gap that they've made. Whereas our infantry is very high quality, we already know we've got lots of recon, so we should be able to protect the anti-tank guns well with the infantry that we've got and use our high quality in, um, reconnaissance infantry to knock out their recon units in, that are going to be attempting to spot our anti-tank guns in the first place. So now let's move on and have a little look at the anti-aircraft tab. This is a funny one because obviously it's a very highly specialised um, tab to look at this, that on the face of it really only has one role. Um, and that is taking out aircraft. The big thing to note is that we'll, you'll have anti-aircraft units that are armoured vehicles with the AA gun mounted on top, or you'll have crews. Obviously, the armoured vehicles uh, generally are much more mobile and useful for supporting pushes, whereas the crewed weapons, once deployed, uh, are very static. Um, but usually they have, as a result of that, better accuracy or better reach. One area of anti-aircraft weaponry that I think is overlooked is actually the fact that, generally speaking, it's just a very long range, very high HE um, automatic weapon. And of course, that makes it great for suppressing infantry and or even putting a bit of uh, suppression and hurt on tanks too. At the artillery tab that we're looking at now, again, we have the distinction of crude weapons and vehicles that employ artillery in them in the first place. We also see a very special kind of unit like the Ram 2 OP and that is observation post or um, observer unit and you can see they've got a special radio in the top left of their unit card and what that simplifies is that they aren't actually an artillery unit themselves what they do is act as an artillery spotter for a off-map battery and this is where the largest and most devastating artillery weapons are called in from and they come with a number of uh, charges for their off-map artillery guns so they, they can't fire the whole time but generally they can be used for um, busting through a really powerful hardened position for the enemy and oftentimes they can come in the form of tanks so it's like an extra way to squeeze a tank into your deck however they are often very expensive so bear that in mind too. One thing we need to take into account with artillery, and I think that's the, the main signifier of how it fits into the deck, is its range and whether it's mounted or not. So a short range uh, piece of artillery like a mortar works well in support of infantry for quick fire missions. But as a result, you're going to miss out on destructive firepower whilst potentially being a little bit more accurate. This means that they're great for quick fire missions like suppressing a individual weapons team or something like that and laying down smoke, but they uh, lose out to the bigger guns in being able to really suppress a general area and cover a large amount of the map with their range. One thing that really you need to bear in mind with artillery is that, for example, infantry divisions do rely quite heavily on artillery and you can see that we, we can bring a fair few artillery pieces and not only that but really decent um, 4.2 inch mortars and 25 pound artillery guns but they're only as good as how much ammunition that they have with them and you'll see for example like the 4 um, inch mortar only comes with 20 rounds to start off with and that's really not going to last you very long for sustained fire missions so do bear in mind that if you're going to bring artillery you're also going to have to go over to your support tab and bring some logistics vehicles to keep them properly supplied with ammunition throughout the course of the game. Otherwise, you're going to sink a lot of money into expensive artillery 
and only get a very limited window of use out of it. If you're playing something like a very aggressive or mobile division, the that's where um, mobile artillery really comes into its own because, of course, it can keep track um, or keep pace with your quick-moving forces, tanks, armoured vehicles, that kind of thing, and it's always going to be there to quickly suppress or aid them with smoke when they come across something that's hampering your advance. And I'd say that every single division should bring something that can move with your forward forces to quickly lay down smoke. And that's because smoke is the quickest, cheapest way to stop a potentially very dangerous enemy weapon from contributing to a firefight, whether that's their, uh, a tank early on in the game. If you smoke it, it can't see your guys to fire at them. Or likewise, say, for example, you're protecting your own very limited tank supply in the early game, you could use some smoke to give them uh, cover to retreat from the engagement with. So let's have a look at the aircraft tab as the final one to consider. And the third Canadian are really well rounded. They don't have huge amounts of aircraft. As you can see, you know, generally they can only bring in two per card. And because aircraft are um, so expensive and, and such potentially dangerous weapons, you will find that they are limited in their availability, particularly if they are veteran. And this is somewhere that uh, air, airborne divisions will definitely succeed over uh, other divisions with they'll be able to call in a lot of air support and really here the the main thing that we want to be thinking about when we're taking aircraft is where does it slot in to the rest of our deck and our game plan because of course aircraft are only able to loiter over the battlefield for a set amount of time they can only carry a small payload so really they are um, precision tools either to be used in defense against other aircraft for strafing missions or to drop a payload accurately on a critical target. Now in the case of the um, 3rd Canadian Infantry, they fulfil two roles really. We have quite good anti-air, I'm not too worried about that, so I do want to uh, bring something like my veteran Spitfires in Phase A to add to my anti-aircraft capability, but because I'm lacking tanks, having something that can quickly nip out onto the battlefield and deliver some uh, high explosive shock to the enemy is something that kind of can make up for our lack of tanks. So I can have kind of a mixed air force here, whereas perhaps other divisions where they have much more strength in their tanks or their infantry or something like that, they, you might see them taking aircraft particularly just to stop the enemy from having air superiority. So they might just take some fighter aces or some high veterancy or very high performing uh, anti-aircraft fighters or likewise with something like an airborne division where they start to really lack heavy hitters in the late game they might be able to call in large amounts of aircraft to supplement their forces there and bust hard targets that their light ground forces aren't able to deal with it really again I find aircraft is a, a really about looking at the strengths and weaknesses of your forces and finding very quick fire tools to be able to fill in those gaps and uh, potentially cover a vulnerability or create an opening for your uh, your strengths for the division to shine through. So guys, that's the end of my broad strokes deck creation tutorial. Um, it really does depend on what the deck allows you to bring and the strengths and weaknesses that you're trying to bring out therein. So really taking a good long look at the units you've got available and making sensible choices around that is the core to creating a good deck but hopefully this helped you understand some of the decision making that goes in behind that if you'd like to see specific breakdowns of divisions i'd really recommend you guys go and have a look at vulcan hd another youtuber who has done some really in-depth long looks at various divisions um available units and perhaps a review of the units that are most worth taking for them and if you'd like to see me do a specific um, breakdown or tutorial on a particular division, if there's enough of you guys, uh, let me know the divisions down below. If there's one that really rises to the top, I'll perhaps look to make a uh, divisional construction breakdown myself. If you've got any questions that perhaps are a bit more limited in scope, again, let me know down in the comments below and I will look to perhaps make an addendum video or you can join the Discord and I can get back to you that way. 
So this marks the end of the first set of tutorial videos I'm making for Steel Division. Like I say, I'll look to make more based on feedback and comments below, and also as I pick up more things from playing the game myself. And finally, I'd like to say thank you very much to you guys for watching these videos. They've been really well received and I hope they've been helpful. And obviously all the views, likes, comments, subscribes and everything really do provide a lot of encouragement and support for me. So I really appreciate that. And I wouldn't be here doing it uh, if it wasn't for you guys watching. So once again, thank you. And that's all for this video. I've been The Discerning Gamer. Until next time. Thank you.